uh, Computer and Energy Engineering Department at University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I'm, my particular research focus is on control systems and even more specifically control systems of wind turbines. And so uh, we've, my, my lab has recently been uh, doing uh, research uh, with NREL uh, and uh, one of the control systems that I'm currently developing is a control system for wind turbines to provide uh, frequency response and frequency regulation services. So I was inherently already in, very interested in learning more about the policy side, and this was a, a great platform for me to, to merge the, the uh, technology and the policy. All right, so let's start our presentation. Uh, today, first I want to, to state our goal with this. We want to introduce the technologies so you can have a better understanding on what the mechanisms are so then you can understand what are the, new, the proposed regulations and, and maybe the, the possible impacts that that will have in Colorado. We'll start on this presentation talking about why is frequency response important and then we go over uh, on frequency response ancillary services then we talk about specifically primary frequency response, what's the mechanism, how does that work uh, then we will go on to uh, the capability of wind energy of providing the services and what's available in the market in terms of that capability right now. Uh, so first clarifying item here, frequency response is sometimes used in different connotations in different documents and here we're going to talk about the equipment frequency response, which is basically the ability, and this is a definition by NERC, but they they use it differently through throughout different documents. So they define it as the ability of the system or elements of the system to react or respond to system re response, and that's how we're going to frame our discussion further on. It's also important to notice that we might refer to it, and some other documents also refer to it, to it as primary frequency response. But that that's the same thing. Please. Can you please what okay. Uh, so, I think the next slide. We're, we no. will be getting to an a explanation of what is the grid frequency. It's actually the AC frequency of the grid, and we'll be getting into why. I, I can explain that now. Uh, so, uh, the frequency. Oh, I'm sorry. The grid. The goal of the grid is basically to deliver, deliver energy to the consumers. This this energy is distributed in uh, alternating signal. So the AC signal they call, and the, the frequency of that signal, that's, that's what frequency is when we refer to frequency. Do you, do you, is that okay? Thank you. Uh, okay, so but why is that important? Why, why frequency response is important? Why have we been doing this? Uh, basically, again, uh, load and generation have to be met, have, have to be uh, matched uh, at all times. And an imbalance between between them generates uh, variations in frequency. And that's how, how we can see and adjust to have always uh, load and generation balanced. Uh, but we have a problem because we, we can't control load. So basically we have to control generation in order to provide the services to keep the frequency at a set point that here in North America is 60 hertz. Uh, but then if we have large imbalances, due to a frequency event, which could be trip off of a, of a, a generator because maybe the, trans the substation just went off because a tree fall fell into the transmission lines or something like that, uh, then uh, th this will, will imply large variations in frequency. And, uh, and then the system automatically has a, uh, in its operation a reliability function to shut off load in case uh, that happens, and that's called load chatting or under frequency load, ch load chatting in, in this particular example. And if that's not enough to, to balance a load and, and, and generation, then this can consequently be repeating itself and lead to large blackouts. Uh, the motivation for us to do this project uh, was basically because, as I've been explaining, it's really vital for, for the system reliability. Uh, also, NERIC has proposed changes, in, in the, not changes because there, there isn't any requirements, but there's proposing new requirements for frequency response. Uh, there's also been a, a national decline over the last 20 years on frequency response capability on all interconnects, particularly on the eastern interconnect. Um, 
because some generators have been disabling their frequency response just because they're not required to have that working. Uh, so procure, procuring sufficient frequency response, again, is, is critical to grid reliability. Uh, also another concern is with uh, high, higher renewable energy integration, penetrations on the grid, I'm sorry, uh, there is increased concern because they don't inherently provide the services as, as conventional generators. And although they could, uh, they are not required to do so. Uh, yes? Yes. Basically, they want because they're coupled. Fr the the frequency of the gen generator shaft, which is through what they it generates electricity, uh, it's coupled with the grid frequency. So they are they if one fluctuates, the other will fluctuate, and vice versa. Is that, does that answer your question? No, it just it just means that it won't. Uh, answer on if if we have a frequency variation, it's not going to change its output based on that. Okay. All right. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. So yeah, I talked about the interconnects. I didn't really say what they are. Uh, don't worry about the colors and all these different names here. I just wanted to make the point that in North America we have four different uh, interconnects: uh, Hydro Quebec. Uh, the eastern, the western interconnect, the eastern interconnect, and of course Texas has its own. Uh, and particularly today, we're going to focus on on the eastern, the western interconnect. I'm sorry, because that's what where Colorado is. Okay, so to, maybe to better understand that now, uh, I just I explained that the grid frequency is 60 hertz, and that's that's everything on the grid is designed to operate uh, around those levels. And, and all the implications on reliability I've explained so far, but why does, why does, does the generator uh, vary its frequency when there's an imbalance between load and generation? We can do a good analogy with that, with this bear riding a bicycle. Basically, if we're riding a bicycle in a flat, uh, flat surface, then that, that's equivalent to having generation and load at the same level. Uh, if we have an imbalance and the load is higher than generation, then and we're applying the same power to the generator or the same power to the pedals, what's going to happen? You're going to decrease your speed, right? And that's equivalent to d decreasing your frequency. Uh, if conversely, uh, the load is smaller than a generation, then your speed is going to increase in case of a slope where you're going down the slope, uh, riding your bicycle, and in case of the generator, your frequency is going to increase. Is that clear? Okay, so So right now we're going to uh, take a step back and look at not just frequency response, but uh, all frequency control services and look at where, uh, what aspect in particular we're, we're uh, looking at. Uh, this figure that we presented here was uh, uh, used with permission from, uh, thanks to Eric Ela. Um, and so well, in order to uh, provide frequency control. We have we have to procure operating reserves, and so these operating reserves are divided up into uh, non-event operating reserves and event operating reserves. And so the non-event is the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, reserves that we will be using to uh, keep the grid frequency at 60 hertz. And so these are divided up into regulating reserves and following reserves, where regulating reserves are uh, those reser that reserve capacity, that generating capacity, uh, that will automatically respond to uh, area control error, ACE signal. That, is, that signal is a metric of the imbalance between energy or power generation supply and demand over a certain area, which is typically a balancing authority. 
And so the following reserve is a manually operated uh, reserve that uh, can be ramped up in order to uh, to follow like, anticipated changes in load, or also if the regulating reserve starts to um, automatically increase its level in order to uh, make grid frequency match, we want to make sure that we have enough of this automatic uh, capability um, on hand so we will increase our following reserves and decrease our regulation reserves back to their nominal set point so that they have the availability, the headroom, in order to respond automatically. But uh, the category which we're going to be mostly focusing on today is going to be event-based operating reserves. And the event, we mean a grid frequency event, which is a loss of load or a loss of generation. If a generator trips offline, if a tree branch falls across a transmission line and we uh, lose power to a whole section of the grid, um, that is a large disturbance on the grid. And so th these, are, uh, these services are procured in order to respond to such events. And we're going to divide these up into continuous Contingency reserves and ramping reserves. So a contingency reserves are instantaneous, as in they are already synchronized with the grid. The generator is already operating and, and um, spinning up and producing some level of power onto the grid, and so they can respond uh, instantaneously. And the ramping reserves are generators that are, are um, on hand, they're parked, and they're not, not spinning right now. So they're not synchronized. So they take a little while for them to ramp up in order to start producing power. So contingency reserves uh, are divided up into uh, three different uh, categories, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And so um, and ramping reserves we can divide into secondary and tertiary. And what these are is we can uh, and relate secondary to regulation reserve where secondary handles the same uh, function except just when there's a large imbalance. Secondary automatically responds to this area control error in order to uh, regulate grid frequency back to 60 hertz. Tertiary is just like the following reserve which is uh, manually uh, operated by uh, the grid operator. But what we're going to be primarily focusing on here today is pr the primary frequency response, uh, which is called primary frequency control, or in this presentation, we're just going to be referred to as frequency response. And so this is an automatic response to uh, changes in grid frequency through generation that has the, such capability. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, this is an uh, example of a frequency control um, th when there is a uh, frequency event. Such an event here where the grid frequency is decreasing uh, rapidly would be a loss of generation. If uh, all of a sudden a, a transformer shorted out at uh, one of the generation stations and it tripped offline, for instance. So we have a loss of, of the generator right here. And there is an inherent response, which is called an inertial response. Um, this is inherent in any synchronous generator, a generator that is synchronized with the, the grid, which is uh, the most common kind of generators and used in steam, uh, any steam plant, which is coal and uh, nuclear, um, gas plants, as well as uh, hydro facilities all are synchronous generators and they inher inherently provide this inertial response. Uh, what it does is it's actually representing the spinning inertia of the generator and the turbine and that has a rotational kinetic energy inertia and in order to change the the speed of that gener all the generators on synchronous generators on the grid they have an inertia and so that um, determines the initial rate of change of decline of frequency. So the more uh, inertia, the more s amount of spinning capacity you have on your grid, the more inertia, the more it's going to resist a change, in, a sudden change in frequency. So that's automatic and instantaneous. And uh, here, this is what we're going to be primarily looking at today, is primary frequency control. And so this is enabled through uh, generators that have governors, uh, typically. And I will explain, I'll explain what governors are and what their function exactly is. Um, and so it's a distributed automatic response, um, interconnection-wide, any, any place that the frequency drops. Uh, the, all these uh, generators with governors automatically respond and its goal is to arrest the decline in frequency and bring it up to a new steady state and, and to stabilize it. 
And then there's AGC, or secondary control, uh, which reacts to the area control error. So as the, as the uh, grid frequency decreases, um, in the, the balancing authority, or in the area at, for which the, uh, the uh, grid event happened, the, the, generator, the area that the generator was in that went offline, uh, the, all the generators will receive a command to increase, all the generators that are participating in uh, secondary will receive a command to increase their uh, power output to return the grid frequency back to the uh, desired frequency of 60 hertz. So uh, we're going to be talking about primary frequency response, the, the response, uh, automatic response to uh, a grid frequency event, and so it's implemented typically by a governor. And so uh, a governor is a uh, mechanical device which is on these uh, turbines that uh, it responds to the, the change in rotational speed of the turbine, which is directly coupled to the grid frequency like we explained. Um, so in order to provide a full uh, frequency response, yes? So uh, that's within a matter of seconds. It uh, starts to react. Uh, uh, so if we look back at this slide here, uh, it starts almost as soon as the, the grid frequency drops below a certain threshold, the process starts of the, the governor um, re increasing or decreasing the uh, power output of the turbine. And it will respond. Uh, uh, yeah, within within a, a matter of seconds, they will they will respond. Does that answer your question? It it depends on um, the particular technology and the implementation. We didn't we didn't focus on looking at the actual uh, response times for different technology. Although. Um, if you do want to uh, find out more information, uh, there are uh, actually quite a few people in the room that can probably uh, answer that question. Uh, Eric? Do you? Well, yes, your And so I'm going to talk about how we characterize governors in just on the next slide. Um, or actually, sorry, on this slide. Um, so in order to provide a full frequency response, we have to uh, derate the, the, uh, that, that particular generator. In other words, we can, if the, the generator is operating at 100% power, we can't we, we're not going to ask it to increase power above its rated capacity. So we need to be operating with some power headroom in order to, in case there is a frequent, uh, frequency event on the system or an under frequency event, we have room to increase that power output of the, the turbine and generator and not ask it to go over its rated capacity. Uh, so that's why it's actually uh, categorized under the reserves um, on the previous previous slide where we showed the tree structure. Um, and so the governor response, it's a mechanical response, but it's often characterized by what's called the droop curve. And so this shown here is a droop curve, and it relates to a change in frequency to a change in uh, power output of the turbine. And so we can see that right around 60 hertz, there's a dead band where we're not going to be responding to normal fluctuations in the grid frequency. But as soon as the grid frequency deviates beyond that dead band, the uh, governor is going to uh, start increasing or decreasing the, the power of the, the turbine. Um, and so the Another important characteristic of a droop curve besides this dead band is the slope um, or the droop. Uh, sometimes it's just referred to as the droop, what the, the, the slope is. And that is its percent change in power generation with respect to a percent change in grid frequency. And so um, 
the NERC uh, Frequency Response Initiative, which we'll discuss more in the policy section, uh, they, rec one of their recommendations uh, for the uh, dead bands of governors is uh, 16.67, plus or minus 16.67 millihertz on either side. As soon as the good frequency deviates beyond that, um, then the, the governor should start reacting. And they also recommend a 3 to 5 percent droop curve on uh, conventional technologies, which is uh, fairly standard for, uh, for governors uh, on the system. So uh, just to understand what this percent slope means, uh, X percent slope means an X percent change in grid frequency corresponds to a 100 percent change in the power generation. So if we're operating at 50 percent power nominally, then uh, and we're having we have a five percent uh, droop curve, a two point five percent change in grid frequency is going to correspond to us going either all the way up to rated or all the way down to rated. So if we're operating at fifty percent, because the five percent corresponds to the entire the changing the power output of the the turbine from zero to a hundred percent. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions on, on that part? You don't have to know what the percentage uh, dead band is that uh, 16.67 megahertz to 60 cycles per second. It's pretty, just for your listeners, that's a really tight bandwidth. We're not talking going from like 57 to 63 cycles per second. It's a really tight Yeah, it is. It, it, you have to regulate the. the the goal is to regulate the grid frequency pretty tightly as compared to when you think of 60 hertz. Small deviations are very, actually very important. So yes, that, that, mil, that in millihertz, that is 0 0.16 hertz change is just that, that dead, dead band, 0 0.01 hertz, right? Yes? Yes, and also if you implemented a, a governor uh, through electronics, it could be uh, much more customizable. You can change the settings and so forth of, of the, the governor itself. And, and that is, uh, I do believe that is available uh, from, some, from some generators, but conventionally it's done mechanically because it's actually a mechanical actuation of opening, for instance, in a steam turbine, opening the steam uh, or closing the steam uh, inlet. And so that is uh, automatic response based on how fast we're spinning. So it's, a, it's directly coupled right with there in that system. They don't need to implement all the sensors and uh, electronic control systems that could potentially fail. So, yes? Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, so it sounds like they are starting to uh, newer technology is having actual electric control systems on their governors, which doesn't surprise me. But conventionally, uh, historically, it seemed like it was uh, mechanical actuation. Um, so now we're going to shift the focus a little bit to uh, wind energy and the capability of, of wind energy to provide uh, such a frequency response service and why it doesn't inherently provide this service. So wind is a variable resource, and the goal of the owner operator is to maximize their profit. And so that they do that by maximizing their energy production and not having their turbines break. And so since often the, the power fluctuates uh, with the wind, because uh, until you hit the rated power of the turbine, you're going to try to get as much power from the wind as possible. 
And so uh, it, it's more and more common that uh, balancing authorities are utilizing wind forecasts uh, for the scheduling of their uh, power power purchase so that if they know the wind is going to increase, they can take that into account, rather than letting the wind do its own thing and having your operating reserves handle the imbalances um, in, in generation and supply uh, from as the wind fluctuates. So um, it, there's been uh, increased uh, concern about uh, wind providing the service as penetration levels have increased. Uh, Colorado uh, increased its capacity 39% in 2011 as it added uh, 504 megawatts of, of capacity. And uh, there's one event in particular which uh, made, made headlines is that um, the, on the Piesco system, uh, at one point in April 2012, 57% uh, of the power generated was coming from, from wind energy. And uh, so that, this is a time when the load is really low. It was at night, and it, there was a uh, pretty strong, steady breeze blowing, so the wind, wind power was high, the load was low, and so the conventional generation amount was, was relatively low, uh, less than half of the power being produced on the grid. So this raises questions on um, it, do we have enough uh, re frequency response capability on the grid if the wind isn't providing this? And so, uh, like I said, wind doesn't inherently provide these capabilities, and this is because uh, the wind turbine is, isn't a synchronous generator. It's not directly tied to the grid. It doesn't feel the, the fluctuations in grid frequency and, and change speed with it. And the reason why wind is a, a variable speed generator is because of both the structural load uh, issue uh, of, of always changing speed at, with the grid directly. And also, um, just so that we can get maximum energy, the wind turbine actually has to change speed with the wind in order to maximize the energy production. So they actually use power electronics in order to, because they pr produce a different frequency than 60 hertz, convert it to DC and then back to AC. So it's an AC, DC, AC link for those of you in power systems. Um, so the majority of the, the wind turbines in the United States are not required to, to provide any kind of frequency response. There's new uh, requirements uh, on the ERCOT uh, system that for a new uh, wind generation that comes online to if, they're, if a wind turbine is capable of providing uh, this service, if they're at an operating point where they're actively curtailed and they have some power headroom, they are, uh, and they're asked to do so, they are actually required to provide a frequency response. Uh, but right now, they're not compensated for a frequency response, so why would they provide it if it's not required? Um, but wind farms can provide and pr produce a frequency response, um, even though they don't directly have a governor. And so the positive sides of this are there's actually potential for wind turbines to respond much faster than conventional generation because the controls in a wind turbine are, are uh, done electronically and we can electronically increase our, 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 um, our, we can electronically extract inertia out of the, the, the turbine very quickly and increase our power output much faster than changing a, a steam valve and having this, the whole uh, generator and uh, turbine of a, of a steam turbine spin up. And so also uh, it you know, allows for grid insurance of grid stability when, as we have higher penetrations of uh, renewable energy on the grid. The potential drawbacks are that the wind must be blowing in order to provide this resource, and um, it's not a traditional resource where if we ask for it, it's, it's available because the wind is, is a, a variable resource. So it adds complexity to the uh, balancing authority if they're if they are going to um, be counting on wind to provide this. They have to have accurate forecasts and so forth. And also you must derate the turbines in order to be able to increase your power and provide and have power headroom. And so the owners and operators aren't going to be so happy because they get money based on how much uh, power they, they are selling. And they also get the renewable energy credits for, or they get their, um, their production tax credits based on energy production. So if they're derated, they're not producing as much and they're losing another stream of revenue. I actually did a, a study of that, um, and I, that will be in, in the next slide, I think. 
Uh, so, if the wind, turb wind farm or wind turbines measure the grid frequency, then they can uh, synthetically uh, provide a primary frequency response through, uh, for example, uh, relating that, that grid frequency through a droop curve, uh, which is the uh, you know, characterization of a, of a mechanical droop curve. Uh, so we can generate these power commands and implement them through uh, the, our wind turbine control system, which is what my research actually focuses on. So since it's fully synthesized, we can have uh, variable droop curve parameters based on the system state, um, how, how much uh, the, the balancing authority asks for wind to provide this resource, how aggressive they want the wind to provide this resource. So it's, it's very flexible as far as um, the implementation of a primary frequency response. We can change a lot of the settings. Um, but like I mentioned, we must derate the turbines to, in order to provide this power headroom. And, uh, but one advantage of doing this is that when we derate the turbines, we uh, can spin them faster than optimal um, in, in regions where the wind power is fluctuating. Uh, so when we're spinning the, them faster than optimal, we are uh, storing additional kinetic energy, additional inertia into the wind turbine, which we can extract out when there is a grid frequency event. Uh, so that is one advantage of, of derating uh, the wind turbines, is you are storing energy in the rotor. Here's one issue why we need to derate the wind turbines uh, if we're going to be able to ask them to provide a frequency response. So um, assume constant wind, and right now the wind turbine is operating as most do, just capturing the maximum amount of energy they, they, they can. So uh, this normal power output would be what it would capture from the wind under a constant wind condition. But if we increase the power uh, output of the turbine, if we ask for more power, then that's going to slow the turbine down away from its optimal speed, optimal energy capture speed. And so we can only extract that power for a certain amount of time before, until, unless either that or the turbine is going to slow to a stop. And we actually need a recovery period afterwards in order to uh, get back up to our normal power production point because we're no longer operating at our maximum power capture speed. And so this is very undesirable, this dip in power is very undesirable because sure, you're helping uh, reduce the deviation in grid frequency by increasing your power output um, if there's a frequency event right at this time. But as far as looking at the rest of the primary frequency response, you don't want it to provide power and then take power away. Something else would have to uh, provide that power to make up for it. Um, so that would be an attempt to provide a frequency response. But if we derate the turbine, and we're normally operating here when this much power is available, we can provide a response and increase the power output. We can even have a power spike above normal temporarily and then actually be, uh, maintain an increase in power uh, from the turbine. Is that clear? No, they're, um, you can run them faster because you electronically, if you think of a pinwheel spinning in the wind, uh, with the wind turbine through the power electronics, we can actually control the electrical generator back torque. That's you squeezing harder or loosening up your grip on the spinning shaft. And so you can just loosen up that grip on the shaft and it will spin faster. And you spin past its, its optimal power uh, production point. And so as you slow the turbine down and extract that energy um, under an under-frequency event, you're actually operating at a, 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 the now the optimal power point, and so you can boost your power, power back up to the normal power operation. And so you think that this is uh, not economically feasible for wind turbines, but in some regions, they're currently derating, they're, they're curtailing their wind anyway. So if their cur wind is curtailed anyways, why not have it provide this service? So that's what uh, ERCOT is asking for, uh, it, for instance, in their new interconnections with wind. <coughs> so I'm going to do a quick, sorry, a quick uh, look at what's available in industry, uh, particularly the GE 1.5 and 1.6 megawatt turbines. Um, other manufacturers also uh, provide these capabilities, but the reason why I highlight 
um, the GE 1.5 and 1.6 turbines is just because they are they uh, provide a lot of documentation on their turbines capabilities um, and make that publicly available. And so I know uh, for we know for a fact that they can provide uh, inertial emulation, so they can emulate the inertia of a synchronous generator. Uh, a primary frequency response, and also they can provide uh, secondary um, through active derating of the turbine. And so this derating can be done, uh, you can think of it as two different, uh, be done in two different ways. If we're following the power that's available in the wind, um, we can derate by either uh, accepting a power command that's a constant power command, output this power, or keep a constant power overhead or reserve to provide a, a certain response where we're actually derating, we're fluctuating with the, the power that's available in the wind, keeping a constant reserve that we can provide a primary frequency response, for instance. And so in my research, um, I'm looking at control systems that can do that, and what we're really looking at is analyzing the trade-off of how aggressively can the wind turbines respond and what's the benefit to the utility grid on w during a frequency event, for instance, and looking at the actual structural damage that is induced on the turbine because you don't want to respond so fast that you're going to be breaking components and uh, wind, wind operators and owners aren't going to want that, for sure. Um, oh, Paul, by the way, I'm sorry, my study on the col what's available in, the, in uh, wind as far as Colorado and the capability is in the policy section. So if you stay for that, uh, it's a little motivation to stay for after the break. Uh, I'd like to uh, say a special thanks to the Colorado uh, PUC and Emerging Issues uh, for providing us the platform of being here, as well as the help of Eric Ela, uh, who works at NREL at the National Wind Technology Center. Well, and Golden now. <laughs> and also Adam Reed, uh, Paul Comore, and Angela Seafor for um, helping us in our, our policy class as well as um, Adam and Angela. Um, we sat down and we were able to get a lot of good information from them to provide this report to you. Thank you. We do uh, talk about that in the next section of the policy and markets of, of uh, but the, really one of the, the bottom line is there's no requirement and there's really no motivation for them to have their governor enabled. Why would they be fluctuating their power output when they don't have to? And also as I talk, I think I talked about a little bit, there's a possible disincentive to do that. We'll talk about that further on the, the policy section, but as they have to follow the sch their schedule on energy output, then why would they do that? Because they, they're, they're mandated to follow this guy. They can be penalized for not doing so. Yeah, because there's a certain tolerance band of, about their, their, their uh, schedule power output that they have to stay within. And th that schedule isn't accommodating of providing a pr primary frequency response, so they could potentially deviate away. Although, then we'll, we'll get into the, the, some of the more of the implications of that. Yes, I do, and it really depends on how much you derate. Because as far as what, during an under frequency event, you have to increase your power output, um, and however much you have it derated is how much you can produce. Wind can produce a lot on the regulation on on the response down. If you are uh, have an over frequency event, you have to drop power. It can do go you know go all the way down to zero, but. Um, yeah, it really depends on the economic choices that are made as far as how much you curtail the wind and, and derate it. Um, so technical is promised. Is that so? I'm 
I think I probably learned more than they did in this process, and I'm starting to be able to at least understand the framework, so thank you very much for doing that. Um, the next part of the presentation is policy-focused. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Um, the chairman, depending on another meeting, may be joining us after the break, um, may not be, so we'll see what his availability is right now. And so yeah, let's come back at 1.30, and we'll dive into the policy part. Thank you.